Okay, why don't we get started? So good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, the next session of our series with Mark Schenker on the Idols of the King by Tennyson. Uh, I hope you're enjoying it as much as, uh, as I have been. I know Mark has been also, um, and we'll continue on. We've got two more after this one, and uh, hope to see you at those. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Mark because we've got a lot to talk about uh, tonight. Uh, Michael, can I just double check? Can you see me on your screen? I do. Okay, because I don't see me, but that's fine. I see me too much. So <laughs> welcome, everybody. Um, I want to say that I mentioned last time that the last tournament is my favorite idol, and in preparing it for this evening, I had that confirmed. Um, Lancelot and Elaine is over 1,400 lines of poetry. The average length of an idol is under 900 lines. And Gareth and Lynette, which we did not do, is almost 1,400 lines. And the Holy Grail, which we did do, is 900 lines. With the final three books, the last tournament is under 800 lines. Guinevere is under 700 lines. And the passing of Arthur is under 500 lines. The poem is shrinking only because it's getting more concentrated in its doom. It doesn't have as much work to do in introducing characters, and it doesn't have as much work to do because it's no longer optimistic. It takes a very dark turn with the last tournament. And in contemplating how I could do everything I hope to do um, this evening, I thought that the best way to do this would be uh, to screen share with you uh, parts of the text that I want you to see and I'm going to do that now, uh, and I'll explain in a moment. Um, Michael, I may need you to help me out with this, I'll, I'll say, because I'm not well-practiced. Well, if you, you click share screen at the bottom, and then you should see uh, a, a variety of windows of whatever you have open. And if one of them looks like your Word document, just click on that one. Right. So I'm, I'm looking at my alternatives, but I don't see anything that looks like my document. Is it open? My document is open and it's on oh. my screen. This is what happened last time. Okay. Sorry for my incompetence, people. <laughs> I'm going to try again. I'm saving the document. I'm going to go to screen share again. Yep. Not happening, Michael. Are you able to do it for me? I think that's what yep. happened. Last time. Okay, thank you. See it? Yes, the question is, do you all see it? Should be. Everybody should see it. Boy. Okay. Yeah, so you, you just tell me when you want me to move things down. Okay, very good. We're seeing the part that I, I'm going to read now, so I'll say what I want to say. Uh, and uh, again, I, I'm explaining to you all that the reason I'm doing this is that I want you to see things in the text. If I were doing this for a graduate level course, and I wish I could with you because it would require too much time though, I'd want to cover three things. One is the trajectory of the plot, as it were, uh, and the, uh, the themes and message of this work, which I'm doing as we go along. I'd also want you to understand something about the work as a work of art and poetry on um, uh, particular local effects, and then what it means to a Victorian reading public rather than a medieval audience. So I'm picking up on what I said last time about the concreteness of poetry, that people who don't know poetry make the mistake of thinking that it is um, uh, airy and ephemeral and philosophical. And so what I want to say is that it's absolutely good poetry concrete, 
I gave the example last time of the grade of iron that comes down when a tar keeps Peleus out of her castle. Uh, the grate of iron comes down through the groove, and he's left alone. Besides the other poetic effects, the rhyme of uh, up sprang uh, and rang and grate and grove, um, groove, uh, this reminds us that the grate of iron actually comes down through a groove. And seeing that and seeing the concreteness of that add to the realism of the poetry. I give an example next from Lancelot and Elaine that when Gawain fails to do what Arthur has told him to do and then goes around telling people, because Gawain is the bad boy of the Middle Ages, that Elaine loves Lancelot and Lancelot loves Elaine, like he's in homeroom of middle school, uh, we're told that word of this um, has spread through cancel, uh, uh, Camelot ran the tale like fire about the court. That should be about the court. Fire like dry stubble, a nine days wonder flared. A fire like that, that a nine days dry spell, very unusual, that's the expression, would flare among dry stubble. The point I want to make is we all know the cliche, the trite cliche of it ran like wildfire. It ran like fire. When you read that, you don't process it because it's not poetical anymore. At one time, to say that somebody sat at the head of the table had a kind of charm to it. But now it doesn't have a charm. Nobody thinks of head as head of the table. Nobody thinks of the White House as a house that's white because it's a dead image. So what does Tennyson do? He tells us it's fire like dry stubble that would have resulted from a nine days extraordinary heat wave. I give the example in the last to tournament, tonight's idol, uh, where Dagonet uh, is telling Tristram uh, that he has um, drunk from the fountain that is running wine in honor of the celebration of this last tournament. Um, and one of the one of the 12 damsels dressed in white has given him a golden cup and he put it into the fountain and he says that the cup was gold, the draft was mud. That is a visual representation of the fact that Camelot has a golden reputation, but it's rotten to the core. And what better image or how powerful an image uh, and so succinctly that the cup was gold the draft was mud. He talks about spitting it out. You could say that how the mighty have fallen. You could say how the golden virtues of Camelot have turned to dross, have turned to mud or worse. But that image of drinking from a cup of gold and finding that the draft was mud is what poetry does in its concreteness. Uh, in the last tournament, Lancelot, you can scroll so I can see a little bit farther down now. Thank you, Michael. Lancelot is serving as the great umpire of the tournament. Remember, he wanted to go off with Arthur uh, to fight um, the Red Knight and to defend uh, the realm. Instead, Arthur has consigned him to be the umpire, and he's not happy about it. And when Tristram enters the list, He's very impressive, and the poet says, Anon he, meaning Lancelot, heard the voice that billowed round the barrier's roar, uh, I'm sorry, that billowed round the barrier's roar, an ocean-sounding welcome to one night. The people behind the barricade, the list, the people in the bleachers, are raising this welcome to Tristram, because he is tall and good-looking and virile. He is a sort of Lancelot 2.0. He also has a king whose wife he's having an affair with, and he's a kind of corrupted version of Lancelot, Elaine, and King Arthur. Well, that passage uh, that talks about voice that billowed round the barriers roar an ocean-sounding welcome to one night. You see, I've put in bold the B followed by the R 
and then the B followed by the R. That alliterative repetition is a Welsh form of poetry known as Singaned, which is used in medieval verse and more recently by poets who are seeking to capture some of that old-fashioned language in their poetry, most notably Dylan Thomas and Gerard Manley Hopkins. I give this example just so you see what I'm talking about. In a poem that is called by its first line by Hopkins, as kingfishers catch fire, dragonflies draw flame. That is, as these iridescent birds seem to sparkle when they dive around the water, and as the dragonflies that hover above the water to feed off insects seem to draw flame, that is, to Gerard Manley Hopkins, the entire world is alive with the grandeur of God, with the electricity of God. Notice that the K sound of kingfisher and the F sound, KF, is repeated in the K sound of catch and fire, so KF, KF, and the DR of dragon and the FL of flies, which I failed to highlight, and the DR of draw and the FL of flame. Very intricate. King fishers catch fire, dragonflies draw flame. It's a way to rhyme without rhyming at the end of the line. It occurs very often in Idols of the King, more often than I would have time to show you, and it's part of what makes it so fluid, so lyrical, and so poetical, even when the theme is very dark. Note the alliteration and the downward movement of these lines, uh, which occur... Uh, I've got to move my own thing here so I can see this. Um, uh, after Tristan breaks the protocol by not giving his prize to a lady who's present. So one of the things that's wrong here, and one of the reasons why Lancelot is a very uninterested umpire, is that the rules of protocol uh, for the tournament are not being uh, held to, including that Tristan goes away with the prize, very unknightly, very uncourtly. And the poem says, Then fell thick rain, plume drooped, and mantle clung, and pettish cries awoke, and the wan day went glooming down in wet and weariness. So besides the notion there of falling, which is everywhere in the poem, there's the idea of thick rain, Plume drooped to the downward movement of that. The feathers on the knight's helmet are drooping. It's not what you see when you see the movies. Their mantles are clinging to their bodies. Very unromantic, very unepic, very uncourtly. And pettish cries awoke. Uh, people are in a mood. And the wan day went glooming down in wet and weariness. So you have wan, went, awoke, wet, weariness. You have the delayed rhyme of gloom and gloom and so on. Um, it called to mind, my mind, the powerful lines that Tennyson wrote in his poem in honor of his dead friend, Arthur Henry Hallam, called In Memoriam where he goes to visit the dead man's house and is told that there's no one there. It's an echo of the apostles trying to find Jesus in his tomb and finding out on the third day by a person who seems to be an angel that he is not here. Uh, that is, the dead man that Tennyson is looking for is not to be had. He talks about knocking on the door and having to turn away, and then ends that section of this very long poem in memoriam, and ghastly through the drizzling rain on the bold street breaks the blank day. I'm going to read that again. It's such a powerful image of devastation. And ghastly through the drizzling rain on the bold street breaks the blank day. So boldness, blankness, Ghastly, you may or may not know, is a form of the word ghostly. We say that someone looks aghast because we mean they look like they've seen a ghost. And ghast and ghost are very closely allied etymologically in uh, Middle English language. 
Um, that's the power of Tennyson. So to return to the last tournament, note the long A assonance in the words I've highlighted in this passage from the last tournament. You have to go. I, I need to see more of that page. Oh, uh, yeah. So I'll read it, and you see that I have put in bold the words that have a long A sound. They lied not then, who swear, and through their vows the king prevailing made his realm. I say, swear to me thou wilt love me even when old, gray-haired, and past desire and in despair. This is Tristram asking his lover Isolt to swear to him in the manner that the knights were before, but swear there the long I have made, say, swear, haired, despair, that kind of echo rhyme. Now, when it's insistent, it sometimes works counter to the sense. That is, it can be so sing-songy in the rhyme that the author is purposely trying to devalue the message of what's being said. There's a kind of desperation in the repetition, and I'll show you that in the last paragraph of the section. So, the morning of the tournament... Um, Oh, so, um, yeah. So what I've given you here in the section that begins, by these in earnest, those in mock recalled, the, the idol begins with Tristram mocking Dagonet, the fool, as Sir Fugle, and that the two of them have an extended conversation in the idol is a sign of how things have corrupted because the fool is not supposed to be carrying on a debate with one of the knights. The fool is there to speak truth to power. And the mocking of Dagonet sets the order for the day, which is mockery. I thought I'd show you that this verse paragraph um, about uh, Lancelot, uh, round whose thick head all night like birds of prey, if you read that out loud, the syntax is a little hard to follow. So I've translated it here for you, and you may want to make note of the lines 134 to 44. Here's what the poetry would be as prose. Lancelot, round whose sick head all night shrieked the flying words of Arthur like birds of prey, arose and moved to the list down a streetway hung with poles of pure white samite and by fountains running wine, where children sat in white with cups of gold, and there with slow, sad steps ascending filled his double-dragoned chair. If you look at those side by side, you see that your mind has to do some work to get the syntax straight. It's impossible to do if you're reading in your head unless you're very experienced with this kind of poetic syntax. This is why you need to read out loud to know what the object, uh, uh, the subject of a verb is necessarily. That uh, fountain with the running wine and those white children with cups of gold, that's what I just referenced. Uh, it's one of those children. A damsel is a young lady. A damsel is a very young lady, is a girl, dressed in white, 12 of them. That's the scene uh, that was referred to earlier. If we now scroll down further. Thank you. So I thought I'd show you something. I need need you to go now. I need to back up a little bit. Yeah, I'm looking at the coming of Arthur. So the idols up to this point, uh, and this is the 10 of 12, the coming of Arthur opens with the naming of a king. Gareth and Lynette opens by naming Gareth and his parents. The two idols about Geraint and Enid, is how it's pronounced. Reference Geraint, Balan, and Balan. Reference King Pelham. Elaine and Lancelot are named early in their idol. In the Holy Grail, so is Sir Percival. The first words of Peleus and Atar are King Arthur. But how does the last tournament open? Tonight's idol of two more idols to come. Dagonet, the fool whom Gawain in his mood had made mock knight of Arthur's table round at Camelot high above the yellowing woods, danced like a withered leaf before the hall. 
and toward him, that is, toward Dagonet, from the hall, with harp in hand, and from the crown thereof, a carcinet of ruby swaying to and fro, the prize of Tristram in the shouts of yesterday, came Tristram saying, Why skip ye so, Sir Fool? So mocking there in the second line of the entire verse is done by the fact that the first person named in this idol is the fool. Uh, the idol mocks the poem. All of the, the idols before now, with the exception of um, Merlin and Vivian, because it's not about the knights, give the lineage and the name of these important people. The coming of Arthur, the first auto which he didn't read, happens in the winter season, the new year, and the poem progresses now through autumn. And here, uh, this uh, pool is dancing. I italicize it like a withered leaf. And I highlighted made mood, made mock. And I highlighted hall, him, hall. I should have done harp and hand. And here that repetition is partly taking the life out of this opening. Images of and references to the fall season or to the falling as a literal or figurative action abound in the poem. They're everywhere. Um, and where the falls of the middle idols uh, have included the defeat. Uh, again, I've got to move this uh, box out of my way. I'm sorry. Too many things on my screen. Thank you. I got it. I got it. Um, while the falls of the middle idols have been tragic, Vivian defeats Merlin in an idol we haven't read. Elaine dies. The terrible failure of the Grail quest and the utter devaluation, devolution, of Peleus from an idealistic youth who comes to Camelot with the sweet smell of the fields, just the opposite of spring, uh, of fall. Uh, all life comes with sunshine, we're told. The hallmark of the last tournament is mockery. Mockery is worse than opposition. Your enemies respect you and meet you maybe on the same level. But to be mocked, to have the protocols of Camelot mocked, is the beginning of the end. The idol opens with Dagonet as a mock knight. The tournament for the Ruby Prize is dubbed the Tournament of Dead Innocence by some of the knights in mockery. And the disillusioned Peleus has returned as a red knight who has founded his own round table of the North as an anti-Camelot. That is, not opposing Camelot the way an enemy would, but subverting, inverting, making a parody of Camelot. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I got it. Uh, so when the Peleus wants to send a message to Arthur, he says, Whatso whatsoever his own knights have sworn, my knights have sworn the counter to it. Whatever you can do, I will do the opposite of. And King Mark of Cornwall may be seen as the counter author as the Mark Isolt Tristram triangle plays off the Arthur Guinevere Lancelot triangle. In fact, just as Lancelot was sent by Arthur to collect his future bride, Guinevere, and in some versions of a legend, Guinevere thinks that the young, handsome man who's come to pick her up is her husband, and she falls in love with him. Just as that has happened, that's repeated that when Tristram is sent by uh, Mark of Cornwall to pick up his future bride, Isolt, she falls in love with him because she thinks this is the king I'm supposed to marry. It's intentionally done as a reprieve with more negative results of the main myth or legend. So, like Arthur, sorry, instead of failing like Arthur to notice the long-standing affair, King Mark is no long, not only aware of it, one of Arthur's problems is he is blithely ignorant. He's too good to suspect. King Mark kills his unfaithful wife in her, in her presence. 
uh, uh, kills the lover of the unfaithful wife in her presence. That's a striking thing. And we're going to read aloud that scene where Mark's way is repeated by Mark and clove him through the brain, a memorable line. So here's the final verse paragraph of the last tournament, and then I'll stop for comment. And I want to say again, sometimes repetition, whether it's alliteration of a sound or an image or a phrase, is meant to be poetical, is meant to enhance. Sometimes it's meant to rob the poetry of poetry, uh, the way that um, verse becomes doggerel when rhyme is too insistent. So here's the last verse paragraph. That night, and I've, I've underlined the M sounds and I've highlighted the D sound. That night came Arthur home, and while he climbed all in a death-dumb, autumn-dripping gloom, the stairway to the hall, and looked and saw the great queen's bower was dark. About his feet a voice clung sobbing, till he questioned it, What art thou? And the voice about his feet sent up an answer, sobbing, I am my fool, and I shall never make thee smile again. That the last word, the last word is of the fool, the mock knight, the person who is supposed to be a kind of conscience to power, is here lamenting that his job is over. You may remember that the the Holy Grail ends with Percival, who's been the narrator, saying, that's what the king said, I didn't get everything he, he meant, which is not a good sign if the person who's just told you the story doesn't really know what the moral is. And here, this um, fool, Sir Fool, who is dancing like a withered leaf, is here on the ground, wrapped around the ankles or knees of King Arthur. and. Listen to how about his feet is repeated. You see it at the end of the line, about his feet, about his feet. We have a voice clung, and then we have a voice about his feet. We have sobbing and sobbing. That is, in the last five lines of the poem, the poet repeats about his feet, a voice and sobbing. Why? Because it is losing its energy to be inventive. There's something in expression that wants to avoid the repetition of the same word. When you have to say, um, I know that that book is very good, the that that is something you want to avoid. And when you're speaking that line, I know that that book is an excellent novel, you have to change emphasis. I know that that book is an excellent novel. By repeating those three phrases about his feet, the voice, and sobbing, and the downward movement that his author is climbing up, the whole poem is dragging down. This fool who is dancing like a leaf is now sobbing on the floor. You know that the time is hard at hand. You know that things are wending down. And it's partly not through what happened but how the poem creates itself in language. That's what I hope to show you uh, in this um, uh, little um, exercise. So I'm going to unscreen share, and I'm going to have... Um, oh, you will unscreen share. Thank you. And I'm going to have um, Michael, if he has questions for me. Okay, hey, folks, uh, you know the drill. Use the Q&A if you've got a question or a comment. Um, I'll ask one just to get give you a little time to, to write something. Now, Mark, I can't necessarily vouch for this being perfectly accurate, but I think I read somewhere in the last couple of days that Dagonet is either the only or one of the only characters in the Idols who was invented by Tennyson. Uh, I don't know that he was the only one, but I think you're right about that. And, uh, of course, the fool is a um, honored uh, character in legend and in myth. In Shakespeare's plays, uh, the fool has the wit and wisdom, and his lowly status protects him from being involved in things like adventures and tournaments. 
but his whole purpose is to continue to prick the conscience to say, old man, in King Lear, Lear banishes his trusted advisor. He banishes the daughter that he knows loves him best. And when he goes into exile, he keeps with him the fool uh, because that's the deal. Yeah. So Dagonet gets named, but you see the significance of the fact that in every other idol but one, the opening is to mention a person of importance and often their lineage, who their parents are, where they come from. So if people have comments or questions about that, I'm happy to take them. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll fill the time by saying uh, you could do hours on each idol just looking at the way the language of the poem the imagery is one kind of way to look at it. If you read a novel and you have the time and you want to be a better reader of novels, put a little S in the margin every time the narration or someone speaking uses a simile. Every time someone compares something to something else with like or as, it's easy to find. I say similes rather than metaphors because metaphor hides them, hide themselves. Similes call attention to themselves. If you were to put an S in a margin, every time you saw a simile used in the narration or the dialogue of War and Peace, it would barely slow you down. And when you're done with the novel, if you look through your notes and just turn the pages and looked at every simile, you might find that there is a motif of similes that you didn't notice when you were reading that would give you an excellent insight into the novel. We know who people are by how they talk about things. And one of the ways human beings talk about things is by talking about something else. We talk about what we know in terms of other things. We explain to people who don't know what we know what we're talking about by comparing it to things that they know. That kind of comparison is not just in poetry, it's in human nature. No questions, no comments, Mark? Uh, uh, nope, nope. I, I, I think you should uh, keep going. Okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> another great theme of these Peleus Atar uh, last tournament, th those stories are clearly linked. Peleus learning that what he thought was going to be the case has now been corrupted, leaves and converts himself into the Red Knight. He creates a round table of the North. Uh, in Revelation, there is a Satan of the North, and he becomes identified in the poem with the Satan snake of the Garden of Eden and of the fall of Lucifer. You remember that at the end of Peleus and Tar, he hisses, oh, yeah. no, sword, uh, like a snake. Uh, and when he reaches for something, it's compared to reaching into a nest of snakes. And there are references to hounds and dogs. When he's treated badly, he's treated like a dog. Um, I mentioned that we're in the first order of civilization, the beast for beasts. And in the second order, a human being killed the beast. In the third order, human beings became the best people they could be. And in the fourth, there's another kind of devolution kind of return to uh, degradation. Um, Peleus is associated, even before he's the Red Knight, with Satan. And when he is beaten by Lancelot, who confronts him when Peleus, angry at what he's learned about his disillusionment, that he'd been betrayed by a fellow knight, Gawain, the bad boy of the Middle Ages, was going to help him out <clears throat> with a tar, and instead he winds up in bed with her. Lancelot fights him, and when he fights him, we're told he puts his foot on the head of Peleus, who's down on the ground. And I mentioned last time, maybe too briefly, that in Christian iconography, that's the image of Michael, the archangel. The two great archangels, Gabriel was the announcer, the messenger, <clears throat> Hail Mary, uh, you're about to give birth to the Son of God. And Michael was the warrior. It's Michael 
who escorted Adam and Eve out of Eden in Milton's uh, rendering of it. And that idea of having uh, the foot of the conqueror on the head of the defeated is made an image in both Peleus and Atar and again in the last tournament. Uh, there are many Renaissance paintings that show Michael dressed as a, a Renaissance warrior uh, with a spear and a sword and his sandaled foot on the head of Satan. Uh, that's what Peleus has become. So I say this to say we've taken the poem now that has referenced Christ constantly and God and uh, uh, a supernatural realm uh, all to the good of Camelot and author as a kind of saint, maybe too saintly. And now we're on the other end of the spectrum. And now what's happening is the devolutions and the significant character is Satan, an image of Satan himself. Thomas Carlyle, the 19th century, a contemporary of Tennyson, 19th century Scottish historian uh, who wrote a fantastic history, a very odd and wonderful book of the French Revolution. Thomas Carlyle was a transcendentalist like Emerson and Thoreau and others on the other side of the Atlantic. But he thought that the problem with American transcendentalism was that it was too positive. And that even though we know by reading a lot of Emerson that Emerson had a dark side, he said in one of his notebooks, some days I am a god in nature, other days I am a weed by the wall. He wasn't just talking about uh, manic depression. He was talking about how hard it is if you are attuned to another realm of reality by keeping positive, because part of the realm of reality, reality are the weeds. So Thomas Carlyle said that what the English language needs is a word alongside transcendental to capture the notion that if you believe in a spiritual realm that you cannot see materially, that you have to transcend this world, not by dying, but by insight, philosophical, moral, poetic, however you get there. It's not enough to say some of these things are of a higher order, like God and goodness and heaven and angels. If there is another order of reality beyond reality, it's also the order of weeds by the wall. He writes um, a book, Carlisle does, called Sartor Resartus, which is Latin for the tailor retailored, that is the maker of the universe, God, seen in new clothes. And that book has an editor in it who is trying to make sense of the work of a man named Diogenes. This sounds like a, uh, uh, a digression, it's not. Diogenes Teufelstruck. So Diogenes is Greek for God-born, Diogenesis. And Teufelsdruck is a German for devil, Teufel, and Druck is Drek, shit. God-born devil's dung is how the more polite editors translate it. The man who is going to give us a new conception of God uh, through his manuscripts is God-born devil's dung. Because you need to take both ends of the spectrum to experience the totality of the transcendental world beyond our world. Carlyle did not believe you got there by dying. He believed you got there by being insightful, moral, philosophical. But his argument is, if you're going to believe in those things that are above the everyday, that are positive and good and nurturing, you have to take the underside too. So he coined the word descendental. Doesn't go up, it goes down. And you see how popular that word became, how successful he was by the fact that nobody is as descendental except me. I have tried for decades to popularize that word, traveling up and down the shoreline of Connecticut to no good. It's an excellent word. If you're going to accept that there is a realm of reality, reality in which good things get created the way God can be 
engendered. You have to take it that things can be corrupted too. If you believe in God, you have to believe in the devil. And in Christian myth, Satan is not the Antichrist. Satan is an anti-angel. Satan is just Lucifer fallen. Uh, there is no anti-God. There may be an anti-Christ that is the spirit of evil working incarnate on earth the way that Christ worked for good. But in Christian mythology, there is no opposite of God. That's why it is God. But uh, Carlyle, who is not a Christian and has any belief, believes that the intelligent person uses his or her imagination moral nature, philosophical insight to see both aspects of the other realm. The Greeks had it right because they weren't troubled by Christianity. They believed, and you see it in all their myths and plays, that the gods are a higher level than human beings, although remarkably petty like human beings, but the gods are capable of great boons, of great blessings, of great power a higher realm than human beings. But Greek myth, drama, epics, plays are filled with monsters and uh, terrible um, amalgams of animals made into uh, monstrous creatures with different body parts. The word monster originally, which just means something you see, uh, demonstrate, monte to show, uh, a monster was an animal born that showed something about the displeasure of the gods who created a pig with two heads or some kind of perversion of an animal form. Monsters in the beginning were freaks of nature, and because the Greeks were people who believed in another realm, they always thought it was an omen about something. Only later did the word monster get assigned to human beings who seemed not to be human, whose humanity was uh, warped. Greek literature is filled with human beings descending to the level of monsters, people who kill their young, people who, to, in anger and revenge at their lover, boil their children and feed them to their enemies. Um, the Greeks knew that human beings were capable of godlike mercy and charity, but they also knew that they were capable of being monsters. And the entire enterprise of Greek literature, this is a big statement, but I'll defend it, is trying to locate human beings below the gods who are great but petty and above the monsters who have no humanity in them at all recognizing that human beings are capable of moving in both directions. I say all this because what this poem has done is it's moved from the upper transcendental realm of Camelot, the city built to music, this ideal of perfection, uh, the, 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 the city that is constantly being built and never built at all. It's now turned in the other direction, and just as Dagonet was dancing and he's now sobbing on the ground, the poem has turned downward drastically. Uh, you may know that there's a Greek myth that some of the renegade gods sent in a group of uh, reconnaissance spirits to Earth to try to find if they could conquer or destroy the human race. They heard about human beings. And in their visit, they found that a man standing outside in the cold, they couldn't be seen, these gods, could warm his hands by breathing on his fingers. And they made a note that these human beings, remarkably, could warm with their breath. And then they watched through the window as the man went inside and served himself a hot bowl of soup. And they saw that he could cool the soup by breathing on it with the same breath. This is where we get the phrase, uh, breathing hot and cold. And they were terrified that this creature could blow warm air and warm himself and cold air, air, air and war, or cool the soup. And they decided they were going to leave human beings alone. That doubleness is the very heart of human nature. 
it was fascinate the Greek. That's that notion of feeling like a god in nature, a weed by the wall, of knowing you're capable of greatness, of godlike virtue, and of absolute bestial uh, depravity. So I'll stop there because I used a lot of this time. But what I'm saying is the poem is now tapping into this great old notion of Satan, of the the uh, the nature of human beings to be capable of the kind of uh, violence and evil that Peleus, who started out so well smelling of the fields and bringing sunshine, he now wants to do everything unauthored. Uh, in the same last tournament, we find that Arthur's knights have slain women and children. We find that when Lancelot is overseeing the last tournament, people are breaking the rules of tournament even before Tristram doesn't give the prize to a lady who's present. Things are so much further uh, devolved than they were even in uh, something like uh, the Holy Grail, or if you were to read it, Merlin and Vivian. So I'll stop there. There's 10 minutes left. I, I hope you see that the plan here is to do several kinds of thinking about the poem, looking closely, microcosmically at the language, the syllables, the letters, uh, looking at the images of downness, of wetness, of drooping, uh, looking at a parallel and reversion so that there is a repetition with a difference of one king, lover, knight triangle, and another. Uh, and then see how the poem taps into the macrocosm of one of the great myths of the Western world, uh, Satan, and uh, finding the evil in human beings. So that was very, very interesting. And in the course of it, Catherine made a comment and interestingly sent me a follow-up that says, I think Mark just answered this, but I'm going to give you her comment anyway in case you want to expand on that in reaction to her specific comment. Um, she says, is there a sense that Arthur overreached? He was too removed from the baseness of human nature in setting up the round table. Yes, I'm not just, I'm not exactly just, right. Yes, I'm not just speaking about Lancelot and Guinevere. We have seen the knights falling from their ideals and blaming those too, but that seems a bit too easy on the knights who are be, who are all behaving badly. It right. suggests that Arthur was wrong about everyone. Arthur reached too high, and we will see this in the next two uh, idols, but as long as Catherine brought it up, thank you, Catherine, I'll say that uh, this poem was written in installments, Tennyson published some of the idols uh, in collected versions with the idea that he hoped he'd live long enough to do all the ones he wanted, and he did. One group was published uh, in 1868, right after the second reform bill passed uh, in the House of Commons and Lords, that expanded the number of uh, males, adult males, uh, who could vote in elections in England. Uh, previously, only 1 million of the 8 million adult males alive in the 1860s could vote. It was expanded and doubled to 2 million. That is, you no longer had to have property. You no longer had to have uh, ancestry. <clears throat> you could be a shop owner. You could be a middle-class person uh, and have the right to vote. But again, only 2 of the 7 or 8 million. So it expanded it by doubling, but nothing near majority. But I cannot tell you, ladies and gentlemen, what a frenzy upper-class conservative and in some case a noble uh, Victorians like Baron Tennyson were terrified at the notion that what would become of England if you just let anybody vote. And some of the more reasonable people like Matthew Arnold said, we have to teach them what to vote for. We have to educate the men of England. Remember, women were not even on the radar. We shouldn't be smug about that. We didn't give them the vote <clears throat> until 1920. Excuse me. <clears throat> and Carlisle, I'm sorry, 
Matthew Arnold said, we should teach them to read poetry so that they have a more discerning sense of where goodness is. And other people were terrified that they would become like the revolutions in the 1840s in Europe, a mob. If you've been to England, if you've been to London, I'm sure many of you have, you have seen these beautiful brownstones and squares, and they're almost always fronted by wrought iron gate that have spears on the top. Those spears are not for decoration. When the people who lived in places like Downton Abbey, who lived horizontally in big mansions that covered a large footprint, when they moved into the city, <clears throat> because that's where the action and often the commerce was, as London surpassed Paris as the primary European capital, Paris was the primary European capital in the 18th century for many things, including finance. In the 19th century, England beat them out. So a lot of those families moved from the horizontal large footprint into the three and four story brownstones that had famously an upstairs and a downstairs. And the downstairs is where the help worked. And so the lower classes became literally the lower classes. The reason they put spears on the gates is they were afraid that the homes would be mobbed by revolting underclassmen. They didn't have to worry about an attack in the country because your nearest neighbor was eight miles away and none of the people you worried about were out there. I say this because when that reform bill came through, many people thought that England was, in the phrase of one critic, shooting Niagara, that is, going over Niagara in a barrel. And one of the things Tennyson is trying to say in this poem is, if we who are well-bred, who know the author legend, who have ancestry and property, who are barons, if we don't take the responsibility of telling people how to behave, we are going to go to hell. And he wanted people to behave by knowing that aiming too high was a problem, that one of the things that an empire has to guard against, like um, England in the 19th century, is being too smug. And he wanted people to see in Arthur that Arthur abandoned his humanity by trying to be perfect. And Tennyson's moral, if we can reduce it to that in this magnificent poem, is aim lower, but aim high in the lower rank that you're moving in. And we'll see that in the last two versions. So, Catherine, thank you for the question. Yes, part of um, uh, let, uh, Arthur's problem is that he's too good to be true. And Mark is a villainous person, but he has killed the man who is having an adulterous affair with his wife, a man who is married to a woman named Isolt. Mark's way is to be sneaky, but Mark acts in a completely normal human way except for the clothing through the brain. You may remember years ago when Michael Dukakis was running for the Democratic slot to be president and then running for president, he was asked by uh, a um, interviewer famously, uh, Dukakis opposed capital punishment, uh, that if Kitty Dukakis, his wife, this was the first question, and I'm sure many of you remember this, if Kitty Dukakis was raped, uh, I don't remember if she was also murdered, would you, Michael Dukakis, presidential candidate, seek the death penalty for the man who did this? And Michael Dukakis, who was a good man, but not up to that question, took the political line and said, well, no, I, I would still hope in that instance I would. I'm sure this is on YouTube somewhere. What he should have said, what he would have said if I was his campaign manager, but I was tied up in other things is, I would want to kill him with my own hand. I would want to clove him through the brain. I'm a human being. I understand that passion. But as a politician... I can't have people do that. I'm capable of feeling the personal rage and even imagining the violence at the same time capable of saying that's not the way. That doubleness is what Tennyson is looking for in people 
And that's what he's trying to do in this poem that swings from beginning to end, from the high to the low, and constantly talks about the doubleness of human beings, of human nature. That's a pretty good place to stop. I think so. That was uh, that was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so, folks, uh, I hope you enjoyed this. I, this was really very interesting. And um, we'll see you all uh, in two weeks for the 11th out of 12 idols as we uh, come towards the last part of this. And uh, have a good evening tonight. Thanks again for attending. And thanks, Mark, for another great program. Thank you all for coming. And, Michael, as always, thank you for the invitation and the collaboration. Thank you very much. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody.